I wanted to talk today about some of the things that we're doing in technical architecture as we build different platforms that we're using for business automation. I do work as an industry analyst, so I spend about half of my time with companies, with, most, with software companies in the BPM industry, helping them to do strategy and uh, presentations like this and so on. I spend the other half of my time working with end customer organizations, mostly in financial services and insurance, helping them to actually build the technical architecture or develop their technical strategy. So I kind of get the opportunity to see both sides of what's going on. I can see the products and how the products are being built. I can see how they're being put to use. And hopefully, I'm able to bridge the gap between them to some extent. So I always kind of see myself as a, as a catalyst between the two different sides. What I wanted to talk about today is how we do business automation or digital automation or digital transformation. There's a lot of different words for this now but basically how we're going to do some of the things that, that Jakob was talking about that they're seeing in some of their customers uh, now. There are a lot of different ways of doing this, and I've probably seen over the last few decades, I've seen every possible way of doing this, from building it yourself to having a monolithic system that has processes built into it, to using commercial off-the-shelf vertical solutions, to using a BPM system that's a more of a monolithic BPM system, to building your own from scratch using microservices, which is a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about some of how that's come to be and what you want to think about as you're on your own journey towards bringing more digital automation into your organization. So I wanted to start with a couple of the imperatives that business has. And these are really imperatives, that they, things that they need to have from IT, whether this is an internal IT department or whether this is outsourced IT. And I just apologize, I'm coming off of a head cold, so if I lose my voice halfway through, it's, you'll know why. I'll switch to sign language or something. So the first thing that businesses need from their technology, the technology that supports the business, is they need to have agility. And they need to have agility in order to innovate. Because without agility, you, without technological agility, you cannot innovate your business models to provide different kinds of products and services. So I have a couple of examples here. The first one, this is a company called The Printing House, or TPH. They are a Canada-wide company. As, as Charlie pointed out, I'm the token Canadian here as well. So it's, uh, they're, a, they're a Canadian printing company, and they've been around for more than 50 years. So they're the people who would print your business cards, who years ago would uh, send your faxes for you when you didn't have a fax machine. Uh, they would print your flyers. They print all kinds of promotional materials. But they decided they weren't going to be left behind in the kinds of services that they offered. So they're now offering 3D printing capabilities. They offer 3D graphic design, and then they offer production 3D printing capabilities on demand. This lets them get ahead of their competitors in that they're not abandoning their old business because there's still a lot of business for print materials, but they're realizing that there's other things that fall into that same category, that same uh, sort of umbrella of competencies that they have, and they want to be able to provide services in that as well. So they're looking at sort of pivoting and providing some new services that live alongside their, their old services and definitely need to have new capabilities to do that. Definitely there's some new equipment they need, but they also need different ways to be able to interact with their customers who might now be uploading 3D models instead of a PDF of a business card. So, so some new things that they need to deal with and how those get processed along the way. The second one I want to look at is, so we're, we're kind of looking at some of the, um, the, the factors of innovation, and definitely customized, personalized service, such we're seeing from the printing house, is one of them. The second one is around algorithmic things. And we're seeing a lot of new algorithmic services that are coming in that just didn't exist before. There's a company called New Paradigm Underwriters that is doing something called parametric insurance. So parametric insurance is kind of interesting. It's normal sort of insurance, and I work a lot with insurance companies, is that something happens and you, know, you as a consumer, as a customer of an insurance company, will file a claim to say, oh, this happened, my house is damaged, or my car, or my property, or whatever. And instead, what New Paradigm does is they will look at different parameters. Now, this is often based around weather, which is one of the things where there's a lot of measurement around weather. And they will trigger claims automatically based on certain weather conditions. 
So let's say you're a farmer and you're in you know, the middle of the prairies in North America. For those of you who are from North America or have been there, the, the prairies are the part that you fly over when you go between the interesting stuff in the east and the interesting stuff in the west. So they're all that flat part in the middle. But there's a huge amount of crops there. So a lot of farmers there growing wheat, for example. So a hurricane comes through or a tornado comes through and it rips up a lot of these crops. Well, instead of the farmers having to file a claim to say, well, this much crop damage has been done. Instead, they're using weather parameters. So they're using actual measurement of the weather to say, well, the winds were more than this amount, so we think you have this amount of damage, so we're just going to send you some money. So they're changing this model for how they're doing business. And this requires, again, different ways. It's a, it's a different way to sell this kind of insurance, but it's also a different way to handle these kinds of claims, to have these things triggered by events rather than triggered by a customer making a claim. The third example is actually from here in Europe, from Allianz, and they're looking at using telematics for a paper use or a usage-based insurance. So again, back to the, the insurance capabilities. But in this case, you have a, a gadget that goes into your car, and you have an app on your phone, and this tracks how much you drive, and it tracks to some extent how you drive, or it can, it can look at how you drive as well, and then will adjust the amount that you pay for insurance based on those capability or based on, on those characteristics. So for example, you think about now how driving has changed. So I live in the middle of a city, I live in downtown Toronto, I don't own a car, I haven't owned a car for several years, and, but I will get a car occasionally. So I'm a very occasional driver, and I might need insurance once in a while if I'm going to rent a vehicle. There are other people who maybe have a vehicle, but they don't drive it very often. There are others who have a vehicle and they use it mostly for personal reasons, and then some of the time they drive for Uber. So they need commercial insurance part of the time, and they need personal insurance the other part of the time. So we now need to have different models for how auto insurance is sold and how auto insurance is, is monitored with what people are doing. And this is what they're starting to bring in in terms of being able to see how can we have different models for how we offer these services. So we're now getting very the usage-based pricing, but also the idea that we just don't have this common model anymore for how a lot of these services are offered. And definitely insurance is one of those. Many of the things that we deal with as consumers are done in very different ways. So uh, this agility is what allows these companies to be able to change things behind the scene, to pr create the processes, create the services that they need to in order to offer these new capabilities and to do it before their, co their competitors do it for them because that will, that will happen. Now, the second thing that businesses need is scalability. This is more of a day-to-day of a -day survival issue, whereas agility is for innovation, which is about survivability on a long-term. Scalability is about short-term survival. So how many of you were on Twitter in 2007, besides me and my cat? Actually, my cat wasn't on Twitter until 2009, but she does have 550 followers. That's... Now, what happened in, uh, when Twitter first came out in 2007 it was built, you know, it was put together, the original developers had no idea it was going to, the, going to grow to the scale that it was. And so it was, in retrospect, poorly architected. It was poorly designed. It wasn't, it had uh, data choke points in, in particular where it's, it was using common databases that were accessed by many APIs going to the same place. So there were a lot of problems with it architecturally. By the time we got to around 2010, we were starting to see a lot of businesses, but a lot of celebrities using the platform now as well. And you saw this graphic, which was called the fail whale, for those of you who weren't on Twitter at the time. I mentioned the fail whale at a conference a few weeks ago, and people looked at me kind of blankly, but if you weren't on Twitter during the dark years, then you, know, you don't know about the fail whale. Did I lose my mic? Oh, there we go. It's good, they cut it out while I'm drinking water so you don't have to listen to me drinking. So what happened in 2010 is that every time Justin Bieber got another million followers, Twitter went down because it was trying to update its databases to show who was following who and be able to update the follower count. So you can't, what it comes down to is that you can't scale bad architecture. And this is kind of a fundamental truth. If you've been involved in software engineering as long as I have, you know that if you build something that, that isn't good architecture, you're not going to be able to scale that. And scalability is a problem because when, you're, when you can't scale, 
and you get some unanticipated demand, then your systems go down, and then your customers lose, you know, lose a certain amount of respect, but they also lose their faith in your ability to deliver products and services to them. Another example of that was Netflix, and what was interesting is that Netflix also had bad architecture at the beginning, uh, again, because they did not anticipate the amount of, um, uh, of business that they were going to be doing. They had no idea that so many customers were going to want to stream so much stuff all the time. So if you're out there you know, binge watching whatever your favorite show is, you should know that now, since 2008, when Netflix began a very public move towards a microservices architecture, that's because they had some very uh, public failures in terms of their infrastructure. And again, that was because the architecture wasn't designed to be able to scale. When some new show that was very popular all of a sudden dropped on Netflix, and you get millions of people across the world all trying to stream it at once, they had these vertically scaled data centers that just could not scale up that quickly enough. So some real issues with that. Now these are both examples of companies that were startups where you kind of expect software to be their core competency, but you also think like you can forgive them a little bit in that they built something quick, they had no idea how big it was going to get, and so they just put it out there and then were surprised by, by what happened. But we also see this in traditional industries. So back to the insurance industry, we see a lot of failures in terms of scaling when there's something like a natural disaster. In 1998, there was a big ice storm in Quebec, in eastern Canada, that took down huge uh, hydroelectric towers. So the big towers, the enormous ones, came toppling down. People were without power for weeks in the middle of the winter, which is quite a disaster. We have other disasters. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina, people again were without power, without homes for a long period of time. And what happened after these events is that the insurance companies settled the claims so slowly that they were sued. There were class action lawsuits against the insurance companies because they could not settle the claims fast enough. Their processes did not work well enough to be able to do that. And most company or most countries have rules about how quickly an insurance company has to respond to that first notice of loss, that initial claim. But these companies were taking months to get people money and the, the, you know, for who were living in hotels while they were waiting for the money to rebuild their houses. So there was a, a lot of issues around that. There was an interesting thing from the, uh, one of the, the executives at Allstate where they were talking about how that need to be able to scale these claims processes was really becoming a competitive differentiator. And this is an interesting thing for the insurance business. And I've been working with insurance a long time. And when I first started working with insurance, probably more than 20 years ago, they only wanted to look at making the sale of insurance more efficient. It was like, we want to look at new business underwriting and maybe some policy administration. Claims is like the red-headed stepchild. It's like, you do not want to touch that because that's just a cost center, right? There's no reason to make your claims any more efficient. Well, that has changed. That has totally changed because claims have now become much more of a competitive differentiator. What Allstate, the, what the, uh, I believe it was the CEO was talking about there, was that how they were using other types of technology to help them settle claims faster. And after a recent hurricane, they were using, so this was in Florida, where a hurricane comes through on a fairly regular basis, and they took satellite data from, that had been captured a few days before the hurricane, and then when they would get a claim from a customer, they would fly a drone over the customer's house to look at how much roof damage there was, because a lot of the claims are for roof damage or for things that are visible from the, ex, from the outside like that. That would then allow a claims adjuster to be able to sit at their desk, watch the video, that was captured by the drone and make an assessment so that they could get that claim settled faster instead of having to schedule a time to come out and climb up on the roof and spend the entire day looking at the damage they could do it in a in a couple of minutes so looking at ways to do things in a more scalable way is a survival survivability issue but it can also be an innovation issue oops That we have with the problem we have with monolithic architectures, and I'm sure many of you have monolithic architecture within your organization, is that it's really the enemy of both agility and scalability. It's agility, first of all, is an, a monolith is not agile, kind of by definition. I don't think I need to go into a lot about why that's the case, 
But basically, with a monolith, you can't take pieces out of it. You can't put new pieces into it. And if you want to make a change, it's often very difficult because you may not have a single business owner across the entire monolith who can sign off on that change. You almost certainly don't have a dev team that understands what a change in one area is going to do to a change in another area. And then rolling out a new version of it upsets everybody who touches the monolith, which is probably most of your organization. So very difficult to do anything in an, in an agile fashion. I'm talking small a, agile, not agile, agile. But scalability can also be an issue. One of the reasons that you have monolithic systems, and, you know, these are old school mainframe transaction processing systems, is that they're highly performant. They work all the time and they, you know, they process a lot of transactions. And that's true that they're performant, but the scalability comes at a huge cost. If you want to scale up your monolith, it costs you a lot of money because you're scaling the entire monolith. You're not just scaling the parts that you need, you're scaling the entire thing, or a huge part of it anyway. And often, if this is on-premise or in a managed hosting environment, when you scale up, you never scale back down again. So scaling is a one-way thing. It's not elastic up and down. And it's also not an automatic thing. It's something you plan for, and then you roll out new servers or you know, new farms of servers and can do that. So you have problems with both agility and scalability when you're dealing with monolithic architecture. So let's take a quick look through these sort of architectures and how they apply back to our business automation platforms. And then I'm going to get it into a bit more about what's in a business automation platform and how BPM fits into all of that. So Monolith, you know, I think we've covered that. This is the, the architecture that we, you know, people of my age grew up with. This was the way that applications got deployed. Pretty uncommon now to have that kind of architecture, but these were the transaction processing systems that still live within many organizations. I go into most of the financial companies that I go into. If I look around, I don't have to look very far to find a green screen on somebody's desk where they're interacting with a kick session. So that's a, you know, there's, the monolith is still there and it's still doing a lot of work in there. So what we came up with instead is like, well, let's make this a little easier. Let's fix the monolith with service-oriented architecture. Now, SOA came with a whole lot of other problems, but it did fix a lot of it. It put in a layer, it put in that services layer that we could use that uh, worked with in, for integration, for communication, for doing some amount of orchestration. And then it let us build applications on top of that services layer to more easily access the functionality in the monolith. In many cases, though, this was just a nice API surface over top of the monolith, and it didn't really give us a lot more agility in, in terms of what we did. In many cases, the SOA structure was also quite tightly coupled itself, so it became quite brittle, too, is that, in that you couldn't make changes to it because there were a lot of highly interconnected pieces within there. Now, eventually, as this grows, we get into this generation of what we're seeing now with the iBPMS, the intelligent BPMS, or in an earlier presentation, I referred to this as the Franken-BPMS, which I think that Jakob liked that term. And in this case, we've taken the concepts of SOA, we've taken that structure that overlays the monolith, but we've added a lot of other things in it. So usually we have some pieces, and you can kind of see it in the, in the green here, is we have some pieces that stretch across that provide the services layer. We also have some pieces that stretch down, possibly such as data layers. And then we have pieces that stretch up and become the user interface. So we have now something that's starting to look like a new monolith on top of the old monolith, because the old monolith is probably still there, and then we have some other services that are in here. It does provide us with the agility, same as we had with SOA, being able to build new applications in a more agile fashion. But what we find is that the things that are within that BPMS are, tend to be quite tightly coupled. So you can't just take out, if you don't like, for example, the way that they're doing machine learning, you can't just take that out and put in your own. You could put in your own as another service, but you would still be paying for theirs because it's part of the, of the monolith, it's part of the whole package. And the same things that I was talking about in terms of scaling a monolith are it's the same issue, is you're now scaling a new monolith. So you're scaling your IBPMS monolith as you, as you move up. There are some advantages to using this in certain scenarios, and I'm gonna talk about that briefly. But that definitely, that's one of the, you know, we're starting to see this kind of emerge. So the last one is looking at this microservices architecture. And this is where we're taking bits and pieces from multiple vendors. We're not dealing with a single vendor anymore. 
And the idea is that we're picking best of breed capabilities. These might be best of breed capabilities at a lower level. This could be about you know, data access or event management or whatever it is. It could be at a user interface level. It could be at any kind of capability level in there. So now we're creating these, uh, a whole assembly of services that we can then use to build applications in our, in our business automation. So if we look at how we've done business automation, definitely the monolith is, a, is old school. The SOA is kind of the, we're still seeing quite a bit of that. And the IBPMS is being offered as the new way to do a, a business automation platform. And I think one of the problems with, in addition to it being a little bit monolithic, is that this is mostly coming from the BPM vendors. So these are the ones that have been in the BPM business a long time. And they have some core strengths. Definitely their core strengths are BPM, as you might imagine. Often their core strengths are also things like decision management. And then there will be all kinds of things that are part of that IPPMS definition. And they're just going to acquire those or build them and sort of cram them in so that they can fit into the category of IBPMS. So you'll end up with a platform that can be quite uneven in terms of its capabilities. You'll find some really strong core capabilities, and then you'll find some other parts of their platform are like, yeah, that's not what I would have picked. So the microservices approach lets you pick what you want to pick. But again, advantages and disadvantages of both sides. So it's a, I think most of you are familiar with the idea of microservices. This is the definition from uh, uh, he, Adrian uh, Cockcroft was at the Netflix when they went to their cloud architecture, and he's now at Amazon AWS as their VP of cloud architecture strategy or something titled like that. But he really talks about microservices being loosely coupled, which is obviously really important in that you want to be able to pull them apart quite easily and bring in new ones when you need them and also that they have bounded context, so that each microservice has its own, its own context, its own part of the domain model that it's working with, and things are internally consistent in there, but now you can have very separate concerns between different microservices. This is when we look at microservices, we try to look at not just single function points, but having a business capability within a microservice, and that means you have to have part of your domain not model inside of that bounded context. I also thought it was interesting that he uses the term service-oriented architecture, which of course became a bad word at a certain point, or a bad phrase at a certain point in time. These are all service-oriented architectures because they're services and they're architectures, and it's just, we don't call them SOA anymore. So microservices, basically, as he's saying it, it's SOA done right. Now, what's in a business automation platform? So I've been talking about these different architectures, but it's in the context of what we're building for a business automation platform. So let's start with what we're going to have in a business automation platform. Let's say you're going to build one, whether it's a, you know, an IBPMS or whether you're building your own for microservices. You're going to start with some core capabilities. And I believe that process and decisions are at the core of all of these business automation platforms. You have to have some kind of process in there. You have to have some kind of decisions in there to be able to, to have your business logic, as it were. So we're seeing some standards-based. Um, you know, I've sort of listed the three main standards in this area around business process management, case management, and decision management. You want to have standards-based because this is how you're going to allow business people to look at the models of what's happening as well and have some understanding around them. This is going to let you do uh, process orchestration. It's going to let you do a certain amount of process choreography as well uh, to do checklist types of applications, to have rules in there that allow you to have um, uh, guardrails on what you're doing in your, uh, in, in your business processes. So a lot of these things work together as the core of there. But that's not all that's going to be in there. We also need to have content. And I see very few business applications that don't have some kind of unstructured content in it. This might be documents. It might be multimedia, like video or audio. It's, you, know, you think of these insurance applications. Somebody might have a, the, the drone video, if you will, is going to get attached to a, to a claim file. You need to have all of this other information that ga gets gathered in as part of this business automation platform. So you have to have some way of, of handling that as well. You need to have event management. Now, event management is sometimes just looking at how you're interacting with external 
asynchronous events, like a customer wants to put in a notification that's going to then rendezvous with an orchestrated process, or your event management might be driving your entire, you could have an event-based choreography going on rather than a process orchestration. So things can get, um, you know, depending on, on how you architect your applications, you can be using these in different ways. How you use process, how you use events, and so on can make a difference in there. You also need to have analytics, um, usually today with some amount of AI or machine learning, so that you can bring insights to the people who are involved in the business processes and also automate some of the decisions that you might be having. So all of these kind of capabilities you get in there. We also have security. You have to have security so that you can tie in with corporate security, keep your, your data privacy and security sorted out. And then lastly, some kind of workbench so that you can build these capabilities into applications. So this is what a business automation platform or digital automation platform or digital transformation platform, they're being called a lot of different things. This is what they do now. They have these capabilities. And you can either get all of this from one vendor or you can assemble the different pieces of this yourself. Those are the kinds of choices that you have. So I'm gonna look just briefly as I finish up here on what that looks like. So who uses these? We have technical developers using them, so we have certain capabilities that need to be in there for technical developers. They need to have all of these process management, the orchestration, and so on. They need to have an API surface for calling through to all of the other things that they, they might have in, a, in their organization. And they also need to have embeddable engines. So these engines that we saw on the previous slide, the process engines, the machine learning engines, and so on, you might, not want to be able to, you might want to be able to have those embeddable within a microservice itself. So the technical developers might be using the business automation platform to build more microservices that would then be consumed by other users of the business automation platforms. So you need to have the capabilities to be able to do that. And then, of course, the DevOps is important for how we're going to roll these out, how they actually build applications and then roll them out in, inside of their environment. But we also have these citizen developers. These are the ones where we might be doing low-code or no-code application development. And there are definitely applications for this, often situational apps, things that might be non-core in terms of the, the core processes, uh, even prototypes that they might be putting together to get an idea of how things might work in an organization. They might just be doing modeling, and that's why the model-driven core of your platform is important, because they might be doing process modeling or decision modeling that's not intended to be executable, but just meant to come to a shared understanding of how the models work within the, within the business and how they should be implemented within the business. Now, we have a couple of choices and when we look at sort of the modern business automation platforms now, and one of them is about using a monolithic IBPMS as a business automation platform. Now, the, the vendors who are in this space, they would say this is absolutely the easiest and the lowest risk way to do it. If you're getting an automation platform, you just get everything from one vendor. It's the, as they say, you have one throat to choke, so it's like everything works together and it can work really well. Now, I'm a consultant, so when people ask me if that's true, I say, well, that depends, because it always depends, right? It depends on the context, and one of the things that we see is that these work really well for small to medium-sized businesses or departments where software development is not their core competency. So it doesn't mean they don't have competent IT, but their IT doesn't, as a rule, build a lot of complex software. And that is the one deciding factor that I've seen in many organizations in whether they go for a monolithic BPMS or build their own out of more of a microservices model is about how robust their software development capabilities are inside the organization. Now, what I also tend to see is that their core processes are not, uh, their core processes are, are not their um, competitive differentiator either, is they are probably in a commercial off-the-shelf system, they might, you know, such as an ERP system. So these are really commodity core processes. Now, who wants you to have one of these? Obviously, the vendors who, who make these. In fact, one vendor wrote a nice blog post just a couple of days ago about why you'd want to have an all-in-one automation platform. I think they saw an earlier version of this presentation that I did, and they were maybe trying to get out in front of it. But definitely, Gartner, who has you know, created the IBPMS quadrant, is trying to push the BPM vendors into that in that direction of becoming the all-in-one application, low-code application development platform. 
And obviously, that's not the only way. You can go for a microservices business automation platform instead, where you will as assemble it yourself. And the places where this makes the most sense is in counterpoint to where we saw the IBPMS, the monolithic IP B IBPMS, is that where your core processes are a competitive differentiator. And also where you have a robust software development capability. This is what we typically see in large organizations or in small tech startups. And it was interesting when, when Jakob gave his keynote is he looked at some of the very large enterprises that are using Komunda and also some of the very small ones, the tech startups that are using it, and for exactly these reasons. They want to have control over their architecture and they want to have control over those, those core processes. I'm going slightly over here, but it's uh, Daniel said that he would come and sing like backup vocals for me if I went over into his, uh, into his time slot, but we're coming into the end here. So the points you want to consider, and this is just getting down to the, the, last, uh, the la second last slide or so, is you want to look at why you would want to use an IBPMS versus why you would want to build your own. And like I said, there's different reasons you have, but you need to start with things like that application architecture. If you have process orchestration as the top level of your application ar architecture, then you could go either way. But most of the IBPMS platforms presuppose that process orchestration is at the top level of every application. So if that's not what you're doing in your applications, then it might not be a good fit for you. If you're building microservices using the microservice platform or using the platform itself, then again, a microservice platform might be a better fit for you. A lot of issues around development tooling, what's available for source code control and what's available for um, you know, versioning and testing, automated testing tools and so on, you won't find as much in the IBPMS systems, but you will be able to have that in a more robust software development environment. So a number of different things, I think we've been through a lot of these issues, scalability, cost as well as an issue, and you have to consider cost on both sides. Definitely the cost of an IBPMS is a higher cost platform and a higher cost of scalability, but the cost of a microservices architecture is the technological skill required to put it together, which is a, a non-trivial feat. So, so definitely something that you need to consider when you're looking at these two together. So getting to the business automation platform that you need, definitely decide which application architecture plat um, patterns that you want to support. It's do you want to be able to do just process orchestration, or are you doing more event-based choreography? Are you building microservices? That's going to determine a lot of what the, the platform can give you as you're, as you're building all of these capabilities. What kind of monoliths do you have in your environment? You need to be able to identify those. These could be your old legacy custom-built system. It could be commercial off-the-shelf systems, like an ERP system. It could be a, an IBPMS that's in your environment that you're kind of working around as a monolith. So you want to identify those and be able to isolate them. So when you do have issues requiring agility or scalability, you can build that into the, into the microservices environment. You don't want to get attached when you're working in a microservices architecture particularly. You don't want to get attached to any specific service. You know, it's kind of like when you're watching Game of Thrones. Remember in season one, Game of Thrones, and they start killing off all those characters that you like? It's like you don't want to get attached to them because they're probably going to die by next year. So just don't shed any tears over that one, but be able to swap in the ones that you want and, and really get to get the services that you need to build, be able to build those up. And then lastly, you know, just like in Monty Python, nobody expected the Spanish Inquisition. It's like nobody expecting Justin Bieber to hit Twitter and, have the, uh, and cause the fail whale through scalability. So you have to think about what kind of scalability events could happen, and when are you going to require that, and where is your system going to break? It's always an issue about breaking those systems and knowing the points where you can scale up easily and when you have to protect your core systems from that, from that scalability. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of looking at the IBPMS versus the, the, uh, the sort of a monolithic BPM versus building your own microservices that would include a BPM system. Um, I'm out of time, but definitely I'll be around here the rest of the day, and I'll be here, I think, half of tomorrow as well, so take a, a chance to have a conversation. I see some of you taking pictures of the slides. I'll definitely be posting the slides on SlideShare, and I will tweet a link to them. So thank you very much.